All right, so people are still sort of filtering in, but uh, we can get started. Um, thank you for, for coming. This is What is a Web App? And it's going to introduce you to the Chrome Web Store and, and building an application for the Chrome Web Store. So hopefully you're in the right place. Just a little bit about myself. For those that um, haven't seen me present today, I, my name is Eric Beidelman. That's my Twitter handle there, at eBeidel at the top. Um, I am a developer programs engineer at Google. I've worked on a bunch of different APIs and, and helped our developers uh, with Google Docs and Sites and Base and OAuth. Now I'm on doing things with Chrome and HTML5 and evangelizing the, the open web and all the cool stuff you can do uh, with Chrome and, and modern browsers. So today we're going to talk a little bit about Chrome. What is it? Where, we, where were we? Where are we at now? Uh, and also in regards to HTML5, what's going on in HTML5 space in Chrome? Because ultimately, you know, we're building web apps. We're going to be building them using technologies like HTML5. Uh, and then we'll switch gears and sort of think and, and talk about what uh, what a web app looks like. So thinking, get your, get your mind thinking about uh, the certain components of a web app and how they look, how they feel. We'll talk about the Chrome Web Store. How do you publish an application? How do you write an app uh, and, and write an installable web application? That's kind of a new concept. Uh, there's two types. There's a hosted app and a packaged app. I'll discuss both. Compatibility, and then we'll take questions if we have time. So let's jump right into HTML5 and Chrome. So you saw some of this in the, in the keynote, but I just want to reiterate it. Um, why Chrome as, a, as sort of a developer platform? Well, um, here's, a, here's an interesting graph. You can see the initial beta of Chrome all the way down to Chrome 9. And this is a, a benchmark of the V8 uh, JavaScript engine that Chrome runs. This is uh, the version 5 of that, that benchmark. But you can tell, the, the, obviously, the bigger bars uh, mean better and better performance. So over the last releases, I mean, we just keep getting faster and faster and faster. This is why applications like Gmail and, and these big JavaScript-heavy and JavaScript-centric applications work and work, work really well. Uh, Chrome has 70 million plus active users. That's something we announced at Google I.O. Uh, and that n number is only, only getting bigger. So if you're targeting Chrome, if you're targeting it for the web store, you have a huge potential user base to reach. Um, stable channel updates happen every six weeks. So we are iterating on this thing lightning fast. Uh, and it's really nice that all browser vendors now are competing. You have Safari, you have Firefox, you have IE9 and Chrome, sort of driving the web forward and building these HTML5 APIs uh, at lightning speeds. You have new Canary build on Windows that you can download. It's a nightly build of Chrome that you can test the latest and greatest, the bleeding edge features as they come out. I mentioned 400% JavaScript uh, performance improvement. So just a, it's a really exciting space to be in. Um, so why HTML5? Well, you've, you've seen a lot of cool demos today. I, I did some in the keynote. We, we've talked about them a little bit. Um, I'll just sort of break up this talk a little bit. I'm going to switch to this mic and just show you a, a few cool demos throughout the entire thing. This is one I actually found today. So this is using the drag and drop API that we demoed in the keynote. But this one's a little different. So let me find a nice image to drop on here. I'll do the Chrome logo. So this image data was read using the, the file reader API in JavaScript. Uh, and you can tell, you know, it's the Chrome logo. It's all pixelated. But the really cool thing about this is that it's using Canvas, and it's breaking this uh, image pixel data up because you can read it at a pixel level. And so I can create a nice 3D, cool aspect of the of the Chrome logo as I traverse around. Really kind of cool. He's also incorporated the device orientation API. So here's another example where I move the computer, and it turns. Pretty neat. All right. So that's why Chrome, why HTML5. Now, why the web? Why would you want, if you're a desktop application software developer, why would you want to switch to the web? Well, I think there's really three three key reasons. Uh, the first one, there's, I mean, it's got, maybe it's not obvious. I, I don't know, but there's zero install on the web, right? You can access um, your application. Your users can access your application from anywhere at any time on the web. There's zero install. There's no friction in that. Um, you know, they get the latest security updates and features that you roll out. When you click deploy, they get the latest and greatest uh, every time. 
uh, it's a seamless update. Cross-platform and device support. This one, you know, this one might be obvious too, but obviously um, HTML5 is, is an emerging technology and it's still being built out by the various browsers. But uh, in, in the long term here, everyone's going to support it. It's going to be used across pr multiple platforms. You, maybe you've heard the term, write once and run anywhere. Well, that's sort of the idea behind, you know, the web. But it's really not just Chrome and the desktop, right? There's, there's different spaces. There's things like Android uh, and the smartphones that support HTML5 and these web technologies. There's also an, uh, a new product, Google TV, right, that launched, which has Chrome built into it and, and a modern browser that can run these cool technologies. So you're running your apps not only on a small device, but say a 40-inch screen. Um, so it's, it's a very different type of uh, application environment than you're used to. And of course, those two products in particular share WebKit as the rendering engine, so you know if it works, say in Safari, it's probably going to work in Chrome, Google TV, uh, and, and Ender as well. So what, what does a web app look like? I mean, we, we, we've talked about sort of applications on the web. I think you guys kind of know. We use these every day, but here are sort of my ideas of what a good, solid web application, at least the, the kind that we're looking for for the store, um, uh, have. So one, it, it's goal-oriented. It's, it should be very task-driven. You go there to, to serve a purpose, and you, maybe you do, uh, maybe it's a music player app, and you're searching for music, or you're playing music. Uh, it's very task-driven and, and focused. The UI is tight. Um, it's beautiful and immersive. So again, I think, you know, as engineers, we often get in this, this niche where we're not the best designers, I would say. But uh, if you hire a designer, I guarantee you're going to have more traffic. Um, CSS3, you know, the graphical capabilities in, in the HTML5 now are amazing. Uh, and so you can really make a beautiful and immersive site that sort of takes up the whole browser space or whole rendering space uh, on whatever device you're on. You should sort of get lost in the UI. It shouldn't feel, it should feel like a native app, basically. Um, and in that regard, it should have a rich user experience. Lastly, it should be fast. I, I showed you the JavaScript performance uh, graphs earlier, uh, but there's also APIs that we talked about in some f uh, prior sessions that really make this stuff lightning fast, things like offline, things like web workers and web sockets for real-time uh, communication. So it should feel native, but it's on the web. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a website. Um, and I won't go to these sites, but this, is, this will give you sort of a general idea of what some of these, what a web app, in my opinion, looks like. So here's an example from the Associated Press. It, it, you go there for a reason. You go there to read news articles. It's fully immersive. It's taking advantage of things like rounded corners and all the cool stuff you can do in CSS. Another great example of a, a music player Twitter app. I mean, these look and feel like native, say, iPad apps or iPhone apps, but they're web apps. This one's really simple. I mentioned focus-driven and very goal-oriented. Um, you know, everytimezone.com, the whole purpose of the site is just to go there to figure out what time zone you're in and how it translates to other time zones. Uh, but it's using things like SVG and Canvas um, to present a really cool user interface. So you get the idea, right? These are, these are web apps, but they look native and they feel native. All right, I promised awesome demos to get you guys excited, so here's the second awesome demo. Actually, I need Firefox for this. So Firefox, uh, there's a new API in HTML5. It's the Audio Data API. And what that allows you to do is actually read data, uh, say from an MP3 file, as you're going to see in a second, and you can process that data and, and do anything with it you want. So you get the raw byte information from the, uh, the data stream. You can also create audio on the fly using this API. So here's an example of using HTML5 audio. This is the audio tag, and this is what it looks like rendered in Firefox, and Canvas to play an MP3 file. But at the same time, it's rendering the spectrum of that sound. It's doing this on the fly in JavaScript uh, in real time, and it looks fantastic, right? I mean, there's no lag here whatsoever. it all day, but I won't. Um, here's just another quick example of the Auto Data API. This is also in Canvas. Is my sound on? Let me do a refresh.
my, is my audio on, on the computer? Maybe not. Well, what you would hear would be sound as I, uh, as I press these different dots. Uh, it, it generates a sound based on the color palette. So that's pretty cool, low to high, based on sort of the frequency of the, uh, the image. Maybe the auto data API was on mute for that particular demo. Um, so that's sort of setting up the Chrome Web Store. Uh, all that, you know, building an app, what is an app, what does it look like, how does it feel, how does it act, what technologies do you use? So here, here's what the Chrome Web Store is. Uh, and before I sort of talk about the Chrome Web Store, I want to talk about the, the current problem sort of on the web today. You have, I don't know about you guys, but this is how my tab page looks every you know, afternoon after I've been at work for the whole day. I have a couple different news sites open. I have maybe, <laughs> you see three instances of Gmail open because I'm lost in my tabs. Maybe I'm signed into different accounts. Uh, you know, I have news sites, I have apps, I have Facebook open, I have TechCrunch, all these different these applications that we use, Facebook and, and um, the readers and everything. It's different, the web is different, much different than it used to be. These are not sites anymore, these are apps. People are spending all their time in these. Uh, so the browser UI really hasn't sort of kept up with this pace of innovation and, and thinking along these same lines. It's not ideal for the scenario. Same thing with permissions. So a lot of uh, really neat HTML5 APIs like geolocation, uh, storage, notifications API. Uh, there's some other ones in the pipeline like device uh, access will be something that will require permission. So it requires user interaction in order to make this stuff work. So what you end up with if you have this really killer app that has all these awesome APIs, uh, you know, on page load you get four or five permissions and it's, it's, it's ugly. I don't know uh, if, about you guys, but it, that's, that's not an ideal user experience. So we can do better. The last problem that the Chrome Web Store uh, hopes to aim to solve is that you have all these users out there. And if you do a, a search for Google.com today, let me play my really cool animation. If you do a, a search for Google.com today, right, you, um, and you find the best uh, photo app or something, photo sharing app, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to get the best photo sharing app out there. Google search is not ideal for discovering applications on the web. Uh, so you have all these apps, you have all these developers. How do you sort of connect them together uh, for developers to reach a, a new market? And of course, that's sort of where the Chrome Web Store comes in. So the Web Store is, is going to be about discoverability, right? You should be able to find uh, the killer apps you want uh, and install them on a Chrome. Or in, in general, if any browser that you access the store in, you should be able to um, find those applications. And the best ones will surface to the top based on user ratings and reviews. So if your app is killer, if you're a small time developer, you know, you, your app can rise to the top if you, if you do a, a good job and users like what they're, they're seeing. It's all about distribution, so reaching those users. Uh, auto update for package apps. We'll talk about package apps in a bit. But it's the same auto update uh, if any of you went to the Chrome extensions talk earlier. Chrome extensions, once you upload them to the gallery, um, and upload a new version, they're auto-updated for all users of your extension. So the same thing will be true for packaged apps for the Chrome Web Store. If you, you know, hit deploy, if you hit uh, publish to the Web Store, your applications uh, will get updated for all users of your app. So that's pretty cool. Obviously, revenue for developers is huge. You know, you can make money off a, a web app. That's a, kind of a, a new an idea, I would say. And themes and extensions will be part of this too. So you'll be able to uh, sell extensions, you'll be able to sell uh, themes as well. Themes meaning themes for Google Chrome. So the whole process of publishing an app on the web store, uh, you're in complete control. So we don't do um, you know, app approval or anything like that. You pay a one-time registration fee uh, and you're all set. You can, you can go ahead and publish. Unless your app does something malicious or it's flagged by users, you know, we won't interact. We won't intervene at all. So you create the app, you upload it, to the store and you provide the product information. Uh, there's things like screenshots and videos. Uh, and then you, you hit publish and you reach users and sell your application. So it's very frictionless. We have a, a payment system set up uh, with a licensing API that you can talk to. Who's installed my app? You know, uh, to make sure they're, they're valid users uh, for, for the hosted apps at least. It uses OpenID and OAuth, so two technologies um, that are open standards using RESTful API. And we also provide things like analytics in the store. So you know, how many times did this user, or how many times did this user, um, people have installed this application, uninstalled it, viewed the, uh, the listing page, and so on and so forth. 
So there's just been this asterisk here on all the payment stuff for a couple of slides now. And that's because um, when we do launch a store um, later in the year, uh, you have to have a US bank account in order to publish on a store. So until it's, the store is officially uh, launched in Brazil, you won't have the, the ability to publish an application. But you can prepare yourself for it, and I do recommend you do that. We'll talk about how. Uh, I just want to mention, when we do launch, uh, they'll be you know, free. You can have a free application. You can uh, pay to install. So a user can choose to pay a one-time fee to install your application. There'll be subscriptions, both monthly and annually. There'll be a freemium model. So you can upload a, uh, a free version of the app, so users can have a trial version. If they like your app, they can choose to install the premium uh, version. And then you can choose your own ventures. So you're not, uh, again, locked into any technology or any payment solution. You can use your own. You can even sell your app on your own you know, server if you wanted to. There's no restrictions. But the, again, the benefit of the store here is that for the discoverability uh, and ease of integration. So what can you do to prepare if you can't tell a thing? Before I do that, I want to show you another cool example because they're awesome. Make sure I have sound. Okay. So this is also using the audio data API. This is uh, basically what they've done is, is create a sound sampler, and I'll just play it for you right now using uh, what is it, the D key or an S key. Let me try to refresh. Can you guys hear that? Can we turn it up a little bit? So this is reading an MP3 file and then producing the spectrum. But what I can do, using the Audit API, right, I can sample different portions. I can also read this thing backwards if I wanted to. You don't really get the full effect there. Let's just show you the capabilities of things you can do with audio and video and multimedia in HTML5. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Okay. I'm done with the audio. Thank you. All right. So I've, I've mentioned installation. How do you install a web application? Um, in Chrome, at least, uh, if users visit the store and, and see your listing and, and want to uh, you know, purchase or, or use your free application, they can install their app your application inside of Chrome. So this is an image of what the new tab page will probably um, or might look like. Um, and this is available in the developer channel of Chrome. So you can install applications. And basically what it is, it, it, it has this big icon, a launch icon to your app. So users can access you know, their favorite applications really quickly. So there'll also be a link to the store where they can find and discover new ones. So I mentioned the launcher. Uh, this is you know, an example of, of what an icon would look like and the options that are available to you. Users have the full choice to sort of open uh, the application in a regular tab in Google Chrome. Excuse me. They can open as a pin tab so they can actually um, sort of s move uh, the app over to uh, side by itself so it's away from the rest of the tabs so to minimize that clutter that you saw. Or they can uh, choose to run full screen, which is kind of cool for things like games, um, or hopefully not uninstall your app. So that's why that one's pushed down so far. Um, what else is there? There's also an option to have sort of a pop-up panel UI. So if you have something maybe like a, cal a calculator widget or a clock, you can run that in a little panel pop-up. The tab and the panel are something you can programmatically choose. Um, the pin tab and full screen are something the user has to manually select from this list. But what this, uh, what this allows you to do, so it's got the convenient new tab page, uh, but it simplifies the permissions model. So if you have an app that uses geolocation, notifications, and storage, it's basically just, you know, do you trust this application, click to install, and that's it. They don't have to grant access to all these different APIs separately. It's sort of at the trust level of the store and installing the application. You hereby say that you trust this application to do whatever it needs to do. So let's talk about hosted apps. Hosted apps are probably going to be, um, in my opinion, they're super easy to create for the store. If you have an existing website, it's literally a matter of, of wrapping that existing website in a manifest file, very similar to extensions. It's actually on the same model. 
websites. So if you have a web website, you add some metadata to it, and boom, you're done. You upload to the store, uh, and you've already created the app, right? There's nothing else to do. But what it does is uh, you, you have the elevated permissions. So this is what you know a pop-up would look like. This app, Ma Google Maps, uh, running in the web store would, would require your physical location for the geolocation and storage for offline access. And so you click to install. There's three permissions right now. I mentioned them before. As new APIs become available, they'll be added to the list as well. So how do you, if you have a web app that exists on the web today, how do you detect that the users installed this application? How do you know they're launching it from Chrome uh, instead of just visiting you know, the app from a, a URL or a bookmark? Uh, and, and what we'll have available for you is, it, is well, it's not really an API, but it's a, it's a property. So Windows Chrome app is installed. You can check that. If that property exists on the Chrome app object, uh, then you know the users installed the app. And then they, they paid money if, you're, if they purchased it or if it's free. Um, otherwise, you know, they're just visiting it as a normal user without install. So you can display maybe a different UI. You can display, would you like to purchase this app or something? So. Let me just uh, demo this and show you what this looks like. I have taken the liberty and spent countless hours on creating a really nice demo application. Um, it runs on my local machine right now, but obviously this could be any domain, any website on the web. We could, we could wrap Google.com if we wanted to. We could wrap Google Maps if we wanted to in a hosted app. But I will show you what this looks like in all of its glory. So the first thing you'll notice is that this is just uh, you know hello world.html. This is not really a web app; it's just a static page, but it happens to use a lot of cool HTML5 APIs. This is text. This is using the fonts API and all that good CSS uh, stuff. But you'll notice that the first thing when the page loads, it wants to use geolocation. So I get the the browser pop up, right? This this app wants physical access to your location. So I'll say yes because I do trust this app. I built it. And for some reason, of course, it's putting us in the water. That's really interesting. So it's probably because of the Ethernet. Uh, oh, fantastic. Well, we, <laughs> we got close to Brazil. OK. Uh, let me try that again. I want to see. The wireless is probably more accurate. But I assure you, geolocation does work. So let's say that worked. Now it's got my location. I've granted permission. Uh, but this app, you know, it's obviously, it's not ideal, but it also wants to send notifications. So when I hit send notification, right, I get another dialogue. And you get the point, right? This is kind of annoying. In order to really experience this app, I have to go through all these hurdles. So now that I've obviously done that, I can uh, send notifications. That's an HTML5 notification. This last one is using the File Writer API, which is a brand new API that, that recently landed in Chrome, uh, in Chrome Dev Channel. So you can actually write files uh, and write directories and read directories and files using JavaScript. Um, and the reason I'm getting quota exceeded error here is because I don't have the proper permission set. Right now in Chrome, uh, at least for the foreseeable near future, you have to be an application and request the permission in your manifest file in order to write and read files. I'll show you the code for that just so you believe me. So I'm not outputting random text. So this is what the file system API looks like. There's a new sort of method on the, uh, the window object. So I can request a file system. I want temporary file access. I'll give it a size. Um, and then I you know, give success and error callbacks. The success callback will take the file system object that's passed to that callback. And it'll basically do a get file. If it uh, finds that file, it'll try to, excuse me, if it finds that file, it'll try to read it. Otherwise, since I have this create true, if it doesn't exist, I'll try to create it. In this case, it doesn't exist on my local uh, storage system. So I get that quote exceeded error. So my uh, error callback is, is, handed, er, is handled instead of the success callback. Um, and then you can do other things like read, uh, read directories and whatnot. But that is not the point. Uh, last thing I wanted to show is that I am making that check for if this app is installed using the is installed parameter. So you can sell the message here. Uh, you know, this launch, this was normally, uh, this app was launched via bookmarker or link, so I just navigated to this page. Okay, so that's, that's a normal web app. I've already built that. Let's see what this looks like as an installable hosted application. So the first thing you're going to do is create a manifest.json file. It's the exact same process as creating an extension. 
Um, you give a name, you know, a description of your app, you have logos, um, there's various logos you can provide for the store. There's one for the launcher icon, there's one for fav icon, there's one for, you know, the listing in the store itself. So you have a lot of flexibility and options there. Uh, but the new property for the store itself is this, uh, this app object, this app JSON object. Uh, and the first property in there is the launch URL. The launch URL is the URL of your application. So if I was to uh, just package this app, this app that I uh, created you know, in, in 10 minutes for the web store, this is all I would need to do. I would just need to write you know, these 10 lines of, of JSON, uh, package that up, upload it to the store, and boom, I'm done. But if users are using Chrome, uh, they can obviously have a better experience. So the first thing, uh, Optionally that we could do, I mentioned that you can launch in different modes. You can launch as a panel app. You can give it a size and a width. By default, it's tabs, so we'll just leave that out. But I mentioned permissions. So again, just like extensions, there's different permission bits that you can set. My app is going to have geolocation, unlimited storage for file writer, and also notifications. So I can set those uh, inside the manifest file. I can say this app will need these permissions. And those permissions will apply to any URLs that I list in the URLs um, array under the, the app object. So any URLs uh, basically get the whitelisting of these permissions. If you're not within this list, then you don't have unlimited storage notifications or geolocation. So to show you this in action, I will close this. I could keep it open, but I'll close it. Using the, uh, the Chrome extensions API, I will navigate to my app. So I'm just basically uh, uploading or, or loading up a, an unpackaged application. It's got all my files in there. You know, there's a hello world.html, there's a HTML file for the notification, and there's the manifest file. I'll click select. And actually, the, it's already here, so it didn't do anything. But I'll enable that application. And so the first thing you notice is my first app is available now in my new tab page. So I can choose to launch this in different modes, um, or I can just see what this looks like when I launch it. So you notice a couple of things. Um, just to prove that this does work, I will refresh this page. I just got rid of the geolocation permission. I said I don't want to access the geolocation anymore, but since I'm a web app now, since I'm an installed hosted app, it's automatically got the geolocation. I can send notifications without a, a permission setting to pop up. There it is. Uh, and you see a new message here. You see log file created. So the file system API is actually working now. We can create files uh, because we have that permission set. And obviously, at the bottom there, you know, we're making the check to see if we're installed via the App Store, um, excuse me, the Chrome Web Store, and indeed we are. So a better user experience, but very trivial. I added three permissions to this web app to make it a better experience for my users. Um, it's just fantastic. So that was hosted apps. But there's another type of app called a packaged app. And Package apps are very similar to Chrome extensions. In fact, they basically are uh, glorified Chrome extensions. So you have a normal website, but you add some extra metadata and you wrap it up in a, in a CRX file, which is basically a, a zip file. Um, it supports auto-updating. So again, when you upload a new version of the store, all your users are auto-updated. So when would you use this over over hosted web application? Well, there's a couple of reasons. So if you don't require a server for one, if you just want to package up a, uh, a Flash game, for instance, a Swift file, you can absolutely do that. Uh, and you don't want to, or you don't have a server component that you want to talk to or host that, that application anywhere. You can just choose it, choose to upload it to the web store, and boom, it's there. And then people can download it from there. Um, there's tighter integration with Chrome, so we'll talk about some of the APIs that are available to the package apps. Um, and they have elevated permissions because they're packaged or installed in Chrome, whereas a web, web app doesn't have that same uh, liberty. And lastly, if you, don't, if you don't care about supporting other browsers, I mean, that's fine. Uh, you know, if, if you want to just target Chrome, that, that's totally cool. It's just like an extension. Uh, it'll only be run in, in, in Chrome. So you don't have to worry about sort of developing for all these different browsers. Uh, but there's more things you can do within a package app. So you have full access to all the extensions APIs, except browser action and page action. How many people went to the extensions talk, by the way? A few people? Okay. 
So page action and, and browser actions are the little icons that appear uh, when you install Chrome extensions in, in the top right corner of the browser that uh, do interaction. Thank you. you can do things like content scripts and background pages. Uh, content scripts inject JavaScript or CSS onto a page based on a set of rules that you specify. Background pages are great for things like polling. You can do cross-domain uh, XHR requests, which is pretty cool in background pages. Uh, obviously, that's not something a normal web application can do uh, because of the restrictions. But there's really much, much more. So you can write a packaged uh, you know, web app for the Chrome Web Store that does things with context menus. So you can modify the right-click menu and add your own options there. Tab and window manipulation, the Omni bar, you can tie into the Chrome's URL bar with your own API or provide search results or, or do whatever you want there. History, bookmarks, and cookies, these are things that, uh, at least bookmarks and history, that you know, normal, um, uh, normal web app can't do, but a Chrome extension has that permission. So that's sort of an overview of the web store. And I've mentioned, you know, you've heard a lot about, you've heard a lot of preaching about HTML5 today. Uh, and a lot of people think it's not ready. There's been some, some posts recently. I, I would say uh, it is ready, and it's definitely ready to experiment with at the very least. Um, here's a picture of 2008, the browser support in 2008 for various APIs. So you have geolocation, forms, you know, web workers. It's very sparse. So this is two years ago. One year ago, we're getting a lot better. So, you know, Chrome 2 comes along. It's got most support here. Firefox is catching up. IE is still kind of lagging behind. But by 2010, uh, you can see this graph really starting to fill out, right? So most uh, web kit browsers are pretty much have everything implemented. You know, Firefox 4 is there. Um, I guess he did. Wow, cool. So he added IE9. So IE9 is doing a fantastic job with a, with a lot of these APIs. Video, audio, for example, SVG. So you can imagine a year, you know, where this is going to be. It's just absolutely ridiculous how fast the innovation is happening. Time for an awesome demo. So you saw, you've seen the device orientation API a lot today. Here is another example of, you know, using an interactive game. So I can speed this up if I tilt forward. I only have three lives, so hopefully this will be fast. But this is the best I've ever done, I promise. Try something tricky. <laughs> but now, this is, now that this stuff is all native to the browser, right, you really have different interactions with applications than ever before. I'll just kill myself. No, no. Well, you get the point. There we go. 727 is not too bad. So here is the current browser share as of September 2010. And just, just soak this in for a little bit. Um, this, is, this is sort of the state we're in right now. I, you know, it's, it's not September anymore, so the numbers have changed a little bit. But in general, you get the idea. Um, modern browsers are, are taking up you know, a good chunk of that. But for the most part, people are running IE6, 7, and 8, which is fine. But the problem is you can't leverage these cool APIs and target those browsers. It's just impossible. So what you do as a developer is you have to hack around things, right? This is the ACID3 test uh, rendered by Chrome. And here's what it looks like rendered by uh, IE6, I believe. So again, between these two different versions, say this is the, the layout and color scheme of your site. You know, you have all these cool CSS tricks. And then, but other users are seeing this. That's not, that's not ideal. They get to score a 20 out of 100. So products like Google Wave, for instance, just as an example, um, did something, you know, they, they choose not to support IE6 anymore because the development cost is way too much. You end up having to have JavaScript hacks and, you know, uh, spending way more time than you need to uh, working around these issues. So what Wave uh, chose to do is have a, a prompt. So if you're in one of these, if you're in Internet Explorer, let's just not support you at all. We have too many, uh, you know, awesome capabilities that you, you can't access. So go ahead and install Google Chrome Frame. And Google Chrome Frame is a plugin. Uh, if, 
We've probably talked about this uh, way too much today, but that's because a lot of people don't know about it, unfortunately. Uh, Google Chrome Frame is a plugin that users install for uh, IE. And basically what it does is, if you imagine the uh, browser of IE6, for example, I think this is not IE6, but this is the image I found. Um, you, the user installs the plugin, and the entire rendering portion, so that anything in the tab, the actual web page itself, is all rendered with the Chrome rendering engine. So you get things like CSS3, you get things like geolocation, all the stuff that's not in that older browser, you get for free. You also get speed and performance. You get the security and sandbox of Google Chrome, uh, which is one of the best in my opinions. Uh, and it's auto-updated along with Chrome, so they get the latest and greatest when, when the plugin, uh, new plugin is pushed. And that includes things like the integrated Flash and the PDF viewer inside of Chrome. It's also open source, so you can go check out the code if you want. As a developer, it, it really, it literally couldn't be any easier to put this thing uh, with inside of your app, with inside of your site. So if you are writing a hosted app and you want other users, not just Chrome users, uh, you know, IE6 users, for example, to uh, access these APIs in your web app to its fullest potential, all you have to do is include a meta tag on your, on your HTML page using the Chrome equals one for the content. Or if you can't you know, add that to every page, you can send uh, a header with the same value there. Super simple. The only problem with this is that the user has to have the plugin installed. So if they don't, then there's no benefit there. But there's zero cost to you as a developer. So that was sort of a high level uh, overview of the Chrome Web Store. I just want to mention that you know, we talked, I showed you an application, sort of how do you package it for a hosted app, talked a little bit about packaged apps, but, uh, but building an app for the store is, is your choice, right? There's no limitation on technology whatsoever. You can choose one from the web stack, you know, the open web stack platform, but you can write a Flash game, you can use a Silverlight, uh, the plugin, you can do things like Native Client, uh, which is running C++ in the browser, that's a Chrome specific thing, but again, uh, cho your choice of technology. So anything you want, a LAMP stack, uh, you know, Choose your own adventure, if you will. So I think the takeaways here are that the web is innovating, right? We're, we're seeing things like, you saw it all today, HTML, JS, and hardware acceleration. There's literally parity with the desktop now, and, and I guarantee you within six months to a year, uh, you're gonna have things like device integration, so you can access the microphone and USB drives and, and all that great stuff. Um, camera, for instance, using the webcam. So, you know, don't wait until t uh, 20, 2022, that, that's I think what the W3C said when HTML5 would finally be ready. Uh, I assure you it, it's out there and living well and I think with the pace of innovation that's happening right now, we're, we're really seeing that in action. Features are first class citizens, you know, things like video and audio we take for granted uh, with Flash and, and other plugins, but now we have the ability to do these and manipulate them using JavaScript inside of the, in the native platform. The Chrome Web Store is a great way to monetize your application, your existing application, or create an entirely new one, right? Um, and if users are visiting the Web Store in Chrome and they choose to install the app, then they have a little bit better experience if you've you know, set up the manifest file correctly. Uh, and you can finally monetize an application on the web, which is, which is pretty exciting. So your HTML5 investment will be rewarded. A couple of essential links, you know, here's the documentation links for web store, for uh, web apps in, in relation to the web store, extensions, uh, but do stay in touch. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, our developer relations team is uh, at Chromium Dev. We treat a, tweet a bunch of great stuff there. You can ask questions in both of these forums. One is for dedicated to HTML5 questions, and one is dedicated for Chromium apps, uh, Chrome apps. But uh, also file bugs. If you find issues, that's the only way we know about this stuff. And you guys, developers, yeah, really, we know we listen to you guys. Lastly, here's the, uh, the feedback link, mgddbr, if you'd like to give me feedback. So I'll take Q&A now, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>